Hey, welcome to Miami. For those of you who are with us in person, continue to fill the room. We're grateful to be here. I mean, for a Tennessean to get to come here at the tail end of summer to Miami is a big deal. For our organization, the Millennial Debt Foundation, uh, it's, it's really a joy to be in what I'm going to define over the next hour and a half as the, the home of the future of conservatism. It may be the future of money. Uh, it may be the future of a whole lot of different industries uh, by the time a lot of the leaders you hear from today are done with it. Uh, our organization set out in January to take the conversation about the fiscal future of the country, big conversation that often happens only in the bubble that is Washington, D.C., to take it out across the country. So we started in Texas, came to my home state of Tennessee. We were in Wisconsin a couple months ago. We were in Oklahoma City two weeks ago. And then we're in Miami for reasons that are going to be very self-evident by the time we're done here. Just to intro the event, where we are, first, Lily Lopez, who, who needs no introduction in South Florida, the founder of the South Florida Hispanic, Hispanic Chamber. Chamber of Commerce. Thank you. Thank you, Weston, so much. This was a surprise. You asked me to speak, but I'll tell everyone something. Recently, we had an event, and we had basketball legend Alonzo Mourning. And it's so funny because he's on stage, and he says, you know, if you want to have a good conversation, Look for Lily Lopez. And the good thing is you don't have to say a word. So he just told me, you want to say a few words? I said, oh, here I am. I just came from a chamber lunch. But I'm very happy, Weston. I congratulate you uh, for putting together this event as a mother and, uh, and seeing a future grandmother and whatever. I mean, we're going to be grandparents. We're going to have great-grandkids. And we want to make sure that their future is secure. The debt that this country has is horrible. And now with the numbers that we see the people coming through the border, 2,700,000 people or more, what that's going to cost our children, our grandchildren, that's enormous. So I salute you and the leadership of this organization for what you're doing. I'm here because of Alejandro Mendieta, who told me to, Lily, you need to get involved. And in every good cause that I'm asked to become part of, I am there. And I'm very happy to see so many people. And I was telling uh, Weston, this is Hispanic time, actually Cuban time. That's you know, right. We weren't actually going to start time. the live stream at 3 o'clock. We're on we're Cuban be at time o'clock. o'clock. No, no, no. When we do events at the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, we have to put like half an hour before. And then I tell my Anglo <laughs> friends, don't come at the time that it says on the invitation. Be there half an hour later, because if not, you're going to be roaming around the room by yourself. So that's how it works here, but we're doing good. So thank you, Weston, and I, I think what you guys are doing is just phenomenal. Just thank getting you. that word out, out of the narrative, out of uh, D.C. We all need to know what's going on with the national debt, right. and it's, it's, it's horrible. Yeah, if you take Washington's word for it, it's all free. There are no consequences, and we exactly. think uh, it's worth at least a humble conversation with business leaders and political leaders across the country. And so as we go across the country and we have these conversations, we like to pull in those who've been really intricately involved in what we're doing. Jane Wu is uh, one of the great developers on the East Coast out of Charlotte, North Carolina, a member of our Millennial Debt Commission. So in the middle of a pandemic, we launched a business-led debt commission. Cam Duty is the chair of a company called Bellhop back in Tennessee, a venture capital investor. Jane's a developer. And I wanted Jane just to give a minute of thought. You've been through almost a year and a half of briefings with economists and members of Congress and experts on the federal budget. Your thoughts on the process. And then as we transition into our next session here, you'll have a couple minute video on this board and uh, online about our organization. Sure. First of all, I wanted to uh, really thank for Weston for his uh, leadership. Uh, he put this organization together January last year. And of course, as uh, our original plan is we will start our organization in Washington, D.C. And then the pandemic happened. So everything become virtual. But uh, through this time, we had a lot of meaningful big conversations. And this, I mean, the national debt is a very important topic, mm -hmm. but it's not a very sexy topic. Mm -hmm. Nobody likes to talk about it. So really, he has been putting all of those Congress members and a lot of business leadership leaders to this conversation. We had a lot of meaningful conversation around why this is happening and how this is happening and what's a potential solution. So those are very, very important mm -hmm. and I'm really happy to be part of the organization. 
as um, Western is leading the way and uh, we have seen a lot of more and more people are engaged uh, and started to paying attention about what's going on. And just a coincidence, coincidentally, pandemic happened. So we see all of those printing money keep going on and our national debt is going crazy. Uh, so right now, here is where, where we are, and we say, okay, people are losing confidence about our government, uh, how irresponsible they are, and uh, people start worry about uh, where is the future of America, and where is the future of the American cu uh, currency. So I feel like uh, this is very timely and very important, and I'm so happy to be in Florida. So I'm a, d a developer, you know, if we ask you where is, where is the center of the world right now, the answer is Miami, Miami. Florida, Miami, Miami, right? Yeah, it's really, you know, while the world is closing down, Florida is kept open. And the last time I came to Florida was two months ago. I think, wow, it's just shocking to me how busy Florida is, how busy Miami is. And so it's very happy um, to be Florida with you guys today. Jane, thank you. I'd be remiss as we get going here not to thank the James Madison Institute in Tallahassee doing business all across this state uh, for helping us put together today's program. You'll see Sal Nuzzo from JMI uh, here in a little while with Congressman Byron Donalds. As we transition to our next segment, which is going to feature two of the I think next generation faces of South Florida politics, you'll see a couple minute video up here about the Millennial Debt Commission of which Jane is a big part. Thanks for being here, y'all. Thank you all. trillions and trillions and trillions? I think the answer needs always to be now. Well, why postpone till next year what you can do now? Even folks who represent themselves as being fiscally conservative, they want other people's stuff to be cut, but they don't want their own stuff to be cut. We love to talk about the debt and deficit when the other party's in power. I think politics right now reflects. It doesn't lead, it reflects. The $26 trillion in debt, that's not actually the problem, in my opinion. The problem is we've got no plan whatsoever from here. We haven't had an adult conversation in this country about debt. The budget's fake. I mean, that's why they don't pass budgets anymore. We've become a, a country full of people asking what the government can do for us, as opposed to asking what we can do for our country. What are we doing to your generation? What are we gonna to do to your children's generation? You are having your pocket picked in what is the largest intergenerational transfer of wealth in world history. Millennials intuitively understand this, that boomers have voted themselves increased benefits for decades. You can't sit down and agree to disagree and walk away as friends. You can't go to family gathering and talk politics anymore because it's so toxic. This is crazy, gang. Your generation cannot tolerate that anymore. You ought to say enough's enough. The hard things that are real are what we really have to do. We have to raise the retirement age. We have to think about means testing. We have to look at the trillion dollars of tax breaks in the budget. We have to control health care costs. Like there are real choices to be made. And my amendment would close this loophole and achieve those savings. There's no longer an actuarially sound social security. I appreciate what you guys are doing because that's where the conversation has to start. And Weston, I want to thank you in particular for building this whole this whole important effort. You all are going to have a voice that we have really been lacking for quite some time.
mic. But we've got our guys here and uh, an extra chair. So if, uh, if Pepe Diaz shows up, we'll save this one for Pepe, okay? All right. Uh, he may be, he's he's going to be walking in here. We, uh, I was told this is just how Cuban time works, so you guys can kind of explain to me as we go. This is what, literally, uh, this is what I heard from Jose Felix Diaz as he was driving over. He goes, man, I, he told me 11 minutes as we were about to start up. He said, that's what Google says. Hey, I'm honored that you guys would join us. Uh, two of the up-and-coming stars of Florida politics, fiscal conservatives. You've got a unique family story that brings you to where you are. Uh, you don't need any introduction. Uh, speaker in waiting, Daniel Perez, uh, State Representative Juan Fernandez Barquin. Grateful that you guys would, would sit down here. Let, let's start here, and I'll start with you, Danny. Last week, a couple weeks ago, we were in Oklahoma City, and Senator James Langford framed our conversation by saying that he thinks for the first time in American history, we're taking the easy route as a country, and we're leaving the hard stuff to our kids and grandkids. For 250 years, we've kind of done it the other way. Hey, we'll, ta we'll do whatever the hard stuff is now, and, uh, and, and it's all about the next generation. How do we reorient our politics? As you think about the future of Florida politics, how do we reorient it away from, for example, as conservatives, from owning the libs, to crafting policy that actually has the next generation's best interest in mind, even if there's some pain today? And I think that's a, that's a great question. Well, first of all, thanks, thanks for having us, and not just Juan and myself, but there's a lot of my colleagues that are here. This is something that's important to us in Miami, but, but as a state, um, it's definitely right in front of us, and it's something that can't wait anymore. It's a great question. And I think there's a, there's a, a generational gap unfortunately, and I can speak personally, you know, my, my grandparents, when they came from Cuba in 1969 with my parents, with my father uh, and my mother separately, uh, when they came to this country, they didn't ask for a handout. What they asked for was an opportunity, and they just asked for a chance to be able to bet on themselves. And unfortunately, for a variety of reasons, the world changes, social media begins to exist, and these fallacies get put before us on what the real world is supposed to look like based on social media, which is just not reality. And the next generation just is not as hardworking um, as the generation of our parents and our grandparents because things have become easier. Technology makes things easier in our life. But I think there's a way to tackle this. There is a message in the world that uh, Republicans or conservatism is for the wealthy and uh, progressives or liberals are, are for, for the less wealthy. And I disagree with that 110%. It's important for people to understand that conservatism and the Republican Party is for all. What they do is instead of giving the handout, they give out the opportunity. And that is what we need to teach our next generation. That what we want to do is we want to give them all the tools in the tool shed in order for them to be able to bet on themselves. But that, that, that hard work that, you know, I'll give you the shirt off my back that our grandparents and our parents came uh, with that mentality, unfortunately, because of what we're seeing on Instagram and all that is starting to leave us. Uh, but, but the time is now, and I think we're doing that. You said that well. I frame it, we inevitably get drawn into a lot of conversations about Medicare. And, and I'd say one of the interesting aspects of American politics today is that if you ask almost any conservative or any liberal do you hope that Medicare is protected for generations to come? They'll both say yes. The interesting thing is you got a lot of conservatives who will also sound an alarm about uh, the potential consequences of trillion dollar deficits and what we might do to ourselves long term by way of reckless fiscal policy. I think what we don't communicate well enough is that we want to create a hedge of protection for those who need it the most. Right? A lot of people ask me, why do you care about the debt? Why do you do all this? And I say, honestly, it's so that the most prosperous society in the history of the world can take care of the people who need it the most, not so that we can just experiment with how great and big government can be. Juan, let me ask you a question, I mean, and, and you feel free to chime in on that subject, but you can't help but be curious as an outsider coming to South Florida particularly, that this place is led by all sorts of up-and-coming millennials, specifically. I mean, we, we're the Millennial Debt Foundation. Millennials, Pew says, were born in 81 or later. Congress is quite literally run by 80-somethings now. You've got a 42-year-old governor in the state, 43-year-old uh, mayor of Miami who will be with us in a little while, 37-year-old Speaker of the House, 34-year-old future Speaker of the House. You're in your 30s. Why is it that way? And I mean, you know, honestly, from a place like Tennessee, you think of Florida, you think of retirees. The reality on the ground is very, very different. Why is it that way, and how does it impact policymaking 
that there is such a strong young voice in Florida politics? I think, well, and thank you again for having me. I really appreciate being here. I think one, it's definitely the term limits. I think the term limits definitely have a very large part in that. Um, it's inevitable that uh, someone who's in office in, in Florida, they can't run for more than eight years consecutively. They can't be, serve more than eight years consecutively, whether it's in the House or the Senate. So I think that is critical right there, right? So you don't have these career bureaucrats, these career politicians that are just sitting around uh, for decades, like Strom Thurmond, for instance, um, who was who served in the House for 50 years in Congress, right? That that just doesn't exist as a as a result of the term limits, which I think is critical. So I mean, there's there's fresh blood. Um, the, the there's there's a huge I'm not going to say a huge turnover, but but a pretty significant turnover every session. And it contributes to that. It's this experience, this, this new blood, these new people coming in, fresh ideas, all right? And, and yeah, maybe the, a lot of the fresh ideas are repackaged, okay? Maybe they're going to the bill drafting and, and taking an old bill and dusting it off, but there's gonna be tweaks and it's gonna be different, but, but largely the term limits, I would say. Danny, I mean, I think when we talk term limits in national politics, people glaze over. You know, I mean, you, you'll get almost any candidate running for office to sign a pledge, but they're not actually making a personal commitment that they're going to limit the number of years they serve. Uh, a few decades ago, we actually got pretty close to, uh, it would require a constitutional amendment to do that in Washington. It's working here, right? I mean, I, 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 all the time I have people, and I grew up around politics. My dad served in Congress for a long time, so I'm, I'm not as naive as I sound when I've ask people, I think a lot of our problems might actually be addressed. They won't go away, but they could be addressed by term limits. Here in Florida, you actually almost see a trickle-down effect, right? If I'm not yeah. mistaken, you're now seeing commissions impose term limits. Correct. I mean, here in Miami-Dade County, we just imposed uh, term limits several years ago, and so we, uh, the commissioners that were there have done great things for Miami, and that, that can't be uh, forgotten either, you know? Some of that institutional knowledge that they give us by serving has definitely helped turn Miami today in, into what it truly is. But Juan is right. Term limits have brought some sort of innovation. I think we've seen it with the mayor. When we're talking about crypto, it's a lot easier for someone that is younger to understand, to grasp, and to grow the cryptocurrency mindset within a community than someone that is a little bit older. But the older people have their benefits as well. I mean, they're, I always tell people when they want to run for office, I always think the ideal age to even think about running for office, ideally, would be somewhere in your mid-40s because of life experiences that you just don't get at 34. And I'm fully aware of that. Um, but I, I think that the term limits is an important thing. What we're, the trouble that we have, and we saw this with the, the attempt to implement some of the school boards um, instituting term limits, is, is it becomes a, a partisan issue, and it shouldn't be that way. If you go down the party line and you say which, who is in favor of term limits and who is not, um, more often than not, you will see the right side say, I, I'm okay with term limits, um, but, but it gets fought tooth and nail. And I don't know about D.C., I'm not there, and we can ask you know, Congressman Donalds later, but in Tallahassee, it has largely, largely been a, a partisan vote when it comes to term limits. You guys, uh, like other states, don't have the privilege of printing your own money. Uh, that's w one of the many excuses that Washington will make for deficits that are now larger than I think any of us a couple years ago could have imagined. I think the national debt, more than anything, is probably a reflection of a lack of priorities. I mean, if you think about the budgeting process you guys go through in the state house, uh, you, you find out very quickly what you love, what you really care about. That's what gets funded. In Washington, everything gets funded. It's like the only thing we agree on across party lines is that we'll just borrow it. At what point, you know, when you're looking at now multi-trillion dollar deficits, at what point do states, and, and here we're talking in one of the states that is equivalent to some of the great countries in the world from a, a GDP standpoint, at what point do states, and this is a question to both of you, consider asserting themselves under the Constitution to say, hey, you know, we want you guys to have term limits, we want you, if not to balance budgets, to stabilize debt, because it, I, I'm convinced, it's the reason we're here, that this is a generational challenge. It's ultimately gonna end in, I think, a generational conflict because we're gonna be around paying for the debt today that's just a, a fun experiment for people in Washington trying to get reelected. I would say that it, it will eventually get to the point where it boils over and there's gonna be a tipping point that's reached where it's inevitable where people realize that this is necessary. I mean, I, I hope that it gets to that point. 
that they realize that there has to be an amendment for, for a balanced budget. There has to be some sort of, hopefully the term limits come soon after that. But I think largely it's gonna happen when you start seeing inflation in double digits, when individuals uh, are having issues paying rent, paying their mortgages or whatnot, you know, and they're starting to realize that, that their wage is falling way behind the prices and that the wages aren't, aren't rising uh, are not rising um, adequately enough compared to the prices. That's when people are gonna start asking questions and saying, I don't understand. Um, I had a great conversation with the owner of a McDonald's in my district about it, and, and he was just taking me on a tour of the McDonald's, and I, and I was asking him about the prices, and just, okay, what's your overhead, or what's your profit margin, and all these questions, and he tells me, well, you know, to be honest with you, I've had to increase my prices, but considering my clientele, I can only raise it a couple of cents every couple of months, right? Because if you, if you raise it more than 10 cents, it's gonna be noticeable. And then that's when you're gonna start cutting into uh, the consumer's pockets too deep, and they're just not gonna come back. So I mean, it's eventually gonna to get to a point, I'm convinced, that people, people's eyes are gonna open up, and I think they already have started to open, open up. I mean, you, you had the president's, um, I think the Congressional Budget Office estimated that for one of these months, I think in June, it was supposed to be maybe 2% inflation over the next year, and just, over that month alone, it ended up being three or four percent. Yeah. So well, I think it's going to become gonna, more outsized in states like Florida, where yeah. there's great economic growth. And I want to I want to chime in because that, that's exactly where I'm going, Wes. That's a great point. People need to understand in Florida we have a balanced budget, but it's not a it, that, that's that's important. But I think what's more important is the amount that our budget is actually at in comparison to other states and what the result has given us. We are roughly it fluctuates, but say the 15th largest GDP in the entire world. If our economy was an actual country. If you were to think about that for a second, if Florida was an actual country, that's where our economy would be. Our budget, give or take, $93 billion. Forget about the Biden bucks with COVID. Let's talk pre-COVID. $93 billion is our state budget. If you go to a state like New York, the budget is $160 billion. That's almost double. That's almost double the amount that we have here in Florida. Yet people are leaving New York to come to Florida. We're getting at least 1,000 people a day come to Florida, and they're most often, more often than not, coming from places like New York and California, they're, they're not coming from Texas. Um, people in Texas seem happier um, with their economic stability than in New York and California. And here in Florida, following the leadership of the Speaker and Senate President and the Governor, the direction that we've taken the economy is somewhere that we should be proud of, and I think we're seeing it, but I, it's, a, it's a important when we're talking to the federal government that more money, throwing more money at bad problems does not solve the solution. More money is not the answer, and in Florida, we figured that out, and I hope other states would follow. Last question for both of you. I think there's momentum in some veins of conservatism, particularly among younger folks, to go tit for tat with the left. And so our priorities are gonna be different, but fiscal conservatism's old school, so let's go propose how we think government can solve problems. I get the sense in South Florida that this kind of rising tide of young conservatives see it differently, and I think some of it's in their Cuban roots. Tell me if I'm wrong, but my thought is that there's a, an appreciation for uh, limited government that's different than, hey, how are we going to win the next election? But it's actually moored in, no, let's keep the things about America that have brought us this far. Let's keep some of those the way they are so that government has its role. Well, listen, government is inherently ineffective and inefficient. Inefficient. Inherently inefficient. Why? Because it's a monopoly. There's, there's no other competitor, okay? The services that are provided by the government are inherently inefficient. Once you privatize those services, one would think, in theory, that things would be, would be um, resolved faster, efficiently, because you have multiple people trying to compete to get to the finish line. Um, the problem is, is, is the government, the, I, I think the federal government, especially under Biden, has grown into a monster where all they do is just keep printing money and just keep giving it money, right? And that's not the answer. Just like what Representative Perez said, I mean, the answer is, I mean, you keep it lean, you keep it mean, Right, and you make sure that the money is going to effective uh, resources. Um, yeah. Look, Weston, he, here, here in Miami specifically, the the term socialism hits home a lot harder than I am sure for 
a regular American in the middle of Nebraska. Um, we've heard it from our family stories, and we've seen it as far as two months ago uh, on national news. The national news has died down, but here in Miami, it's daily. And so we've heard these stories of what more government looks like and what more government trying to solve your problems results in. That is not what we want here in Miami. That's not what we want in Florida. But here, it's, it's in our ears every day because we heard about the stories where I left with a suitcase and $5 in my pocket. That is not, you know, th that is not um, a, a, a unique story in Miami. That is the regular story in Miami. Many families wish that they could have stayed in their country and prospered under a capitalistic democracy if they had their choice. But we were fortunate enough that the United States opened their arms to us. We came to this country and we took that opportunity by the reins and we made it the best we possibly could. But we saw what someone, the government, taking your opportunity away from you results in. It results into an island where there is zero freedom, zero. I don't care what people say, there is zero freedom on that island. There is no freedom of choice, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, there's nothing. There's nothing. So here at home, it hits a little bit harder, and our job as, as the younger generation, as hopefully the next generation of conservatism, not just fiscally, by the way, across the board conservatism, is to make sure we spread that message. And we try and do that. And you know, we travel different parts of this state, and we'll go to different conferences across this country. And our number one job is, I, I like to talk about that. I say, well, let me tell you a story about my family, so you can open up the eyes to those that maybe haven't heard the stories. Because when they hear the stories, they'll understand it. It's about messaging. And us as conservatives need to do a better job of messaging. If there's nothing else that we take from today, I hope it is that messaging is super important. And we need to do a better job of that, because we're on the right side of policy. We just need to message it better to the next generation. Yeah. Hey, Juan, thanks for joining us. Uh, last second as it was, you got here, and uh, we're, we're glad you did. And Danny, thanks for your leadership. My pleasure. Uh, coming you. up in the transition here, you'll see a familiar face, uh, Senator and former Speaker uh, Marco Rubio wanted to be with us. We went round and round, almost got it scheduled right. He sent a video uh, instead. He's been very gracious to our organization. He's an advisor to the Millennial Debt Commission that we talked about earlier. And uh, after that, Sal Nuzzo with the James Madison Institute uh, is going to be up here for about 20 minutes with Byron Donalds, congressman from the other coast of Florida. Thanks, y'all, for being with us. Thank you. You know, over the past year and a half, the federal government has allocated nearly $6 trillion towards the coronavirus pandemic. Now, some of the spending, especially early on, early on during the pandemic, was, was needed. It was justified. No one had a rainy day fund to save families and small businesses who were struggling, who had been told by the government they had to lock down, they couldn't open the doors, and through no fault of their own, they needed resources to stay afloat. We provided them with that. But the Democrats now and their recent spending is a completely different story. Already in March of this year, President Biden and the Democrats pushed out, on top of all that, an additional $1.9 trillion, and it was a straight party line vote. And this bill spent billions on items that have nothing to do with COVID, nothing at all. A bailout for state and local governments, including state and local governments that have no shortfall. Some of them had record years in revenues. Now, the Democrats have come back and they want to ram through another $3.5 trillion on top of that, through a, a completely partisan effort. That include policies, not just spending policies that would be terrible for our country. And it would fund pet projects for Democrats that they would then come back and pay for through accounting gimmicks, so it wouldn't really pay for anything, ultimately by raising taxes in a way that would destroy our economy. So this isn't just reckless spending, it's the destruction of our economy and our economic opportunity. And we're already seeing inflation skyrocket. In fact, a recent report uh, by the Department of Labor Statistics shows that prices were up 5.4% compared to last year. So in addition to the tie tax that are coming, we're already seeing increases at the grocery store, at the gas pump, and travel costs. Inflation is biting away at families who are already struggling to recover as we're trying to rebuild our economy. Um, this level of spending is just simply not just unsustainable, it's reckless. The, the U.S. debt to GDP ratio is currently at a record number. As of May of this year, the national debt was approximately $28.3 trillion. And that's before all this other stuff gets passed. We can't sustain that for much longer. We can't sustain that because of the increased prices and because generations are now going to be stuck with massive 
taxes that they're gonna have to pay in order just to break even on some of the stuff. But that's why I supported the balanced budget amendment to the Constitution, because that would make sure that Congress has to constitutionally account for what it's doing every single year and not just simply printing and borrowing more money against the future to pay for things now that politicians want. And, and I'm gonna to continue to advocate for those sorts of things because the national debt is truly becoming a looming crisis. Before all is said and done, we're gonna owe so much money that we're gonna spend more on servicing the debt of this country than we will on defending our country. So I encourage you to keep fighting against debt and raise it as an issue because it is a singular threat that continues to confront us and grow, growing graver by the day. Thank you for what you guys are doing. Distancing here. I'm just trying to see. Oh my God. There we go. I'm just trying to sit under my name, man. I don't want to be confused for you. Nah, yeah. I don't look like a Sal. I don't yeah, know about I, you guys. W one thing I will never be mistaken for is a United States congressman. Um, Shoot, neither will I. <laughs> <laughs> you guys will see why after we're done with this little uh, talk. Oh, yes. Well, Congressman, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, for those of you I haven't met, my name is Sal Newzone with the James Madison, found, uh, James Madison Institute. We're partnering with the Millennium Debt Foundation uh, for this event, and thank you to Weston for uh, including us in this. Thank you for joining us. I uh, appreciate you getting over here uh, on, on your way back up to, uh, to the swamp. Um, would like to jump in with, a, with just a softball. What, what has been your take on your first year in, in Congress? What, what's been the good, the bad, and the ugly? I mean, the hot take is I miss the Florida legislature so much. I got to tell you, man, like Congress is a mess. And I'm going to just be real blunt with you guys. I don't really mince words. The people's house, it's a confluence of idiocy, like moving all through the place. You have policies that come down for votes that they might sound good in their own little space, but when you put them together with the other policies and you start to take a look at everything we're doing as a country, it, is, it makes no sense at all. It is actually the things you don't want to do in an economy or in a society if you believe that the, live, that the government in the lives of free people is actually supposed to be limited and supposed to be restrained. You couple that with the Senate where you know everything basically moves by either unanimous consent or breaking up a uh, culture, the filibuster, or however you want to talk about it. It's a place where the right policies for our country just simply don't come together because you have a lot of members of Congress who've been in DC for far too long. They are completely detached from the reality that is America. Um, and then also with where we are right now, we have a chief executive <clears throat> who, to be blunt, I'm not even sure what he thinks, let alone if he's thinking. So my experience these last eight months has, it's just been God awful. So um, I told you I was going to be blunt, right? We're, gonna, <laughs> we're just going to get to it. Okay, so here we go. You, you spent four years in the Florida House, and uh, as Rep Perez and Rep Fernandez Barkin mentioned, you had the requirement to pass a balanced budget each year. That is not the case with the United States Congress. And so how has it been navigating not just the opposing party, but folks within your party in how the spending plans kind of unfold day to day? Asking that question, the assumption is that the members are actually talking about the federal budget. We don't talk about it. I, I want people to hear me. We do not talk about the federal budget as members of Congress. You might, I'm talking about as the body collectively. You might have members who are in an appropriating committee or in an authorizing committee who talk about spending dollars. This is actually happening right now because uh, the Democrats have launched uh, budget reconciliation for the second time this actual year. I know we're in different fiscal years with the federal budget, but it's the twice this year. So the authorizing committees are, 
voting on a measure to create spending that has come out of the speaker's office. Nancy Pelosi and Kevin McCarthy do not talk. They're not even conversating right now about, okay, well, if we're going to spend $3.5 trillion, what's that even going to look like? Here's the deal. Here's kind of the package. None of that happens. So there is no conversation amongst the members of Congress. You have a couple of members who take the time to actually try to figure out and learn what the federal budget is. Like, I'm actually going through that process right now. I'm, I'm a freshman, so I'm like, okay, let me actually figure out what's supposed to be in there and how that's kind of made up. Most members do not do this. And so the way the place works right now, especially in the House, it's coming out of the Speaker's office. The Speaker has told the chairman of the 12 authorizing committees, here's how much you have to spend and here's what we're doing with it. They might have a little bit of wiggle room here or there, but because they have the votes and the way Nancy Pelosi runs the House, that thing is going on a party line vote, vote, no amendments, even though Republicans are bringing every sensible amendment known to man, they're all being voted down, they go straight to the floor, it's gonna go over to the Senate, and in the Senate, literally what we're waiting on is, how much is Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema gonna bring some semblance of fiscal sanity to Congress? And they're Democrats. And they're Democrats, oh yeah, they're Democrats. But it's really about what fiscal sanity they're bringing. I mean, Joe Manchin is a Democrat senator, but he represents a red state. Yep. Kirsten Sinema is a Democrat senator, she represents a purple state, Arizona. So the question is, how much sense are they going to, frankly, demand out of the Democrat side of the aisle? And essentially, that's what you're going to see roll up to the White House. In oh, I'm sorry, let me back up. Budget reconciliation actually doesn't go to the White House. It will just be, take effect. My, I'm sorry. <laughs> Wrong process. So, uh, so um, in your years in the House, you had kind of a, a, a good experience, I would imagine, working with conservative, fiscally conservative leadership who kept the spending in check for the state of Florida, for the most part, compared to what you it saw, You saw how I nodded my head like, yeah. <laughs> compared yeah. to what it otherwise might have they been. Were, they were pretty good about it. How is it navigating leadership and kind of their influence over the rank and file members? And is there hope for folks like yourself and other freshmen eventually kind of ascending the ranks to be able to have more influence over the leadership conversations on fiscal, uh, fiscal conditions? Well, right now, I mean, look, I told you guys kind of how I was working on the Democrat side. Like, it's Nancy's show, Nancy's doing what she wants. The chairman, I was actually talking up on a side about this. The chairman on the Democrat side of the aisle have been chairman under Nancy Pelosi for like, 10, 12 years. And if they're in the minority, they're ranking members and they go back to being chairman. These are the members of Congress who've been around for like forever. Like they have been in Congress since Clinton was president or George W. Bush was president. That's how long they've been there. They're chairman now. And under Nancy Pelosi or Democrat leadership, they're really not going to be swapped out. On the Republican side, we term limit our chairman. And really how you have influence is you have to become a chairman and you have more say. But it all typically comes from your, your leader. I will say the difference about the Republican conference than the Democrat conference is we're having more turnover in our, in our conference. There are more younger Republicans that are actually coming into the space because you have Republican members who got tired of it, retired. They didn't want to serve in a minority anymore. I mean, you got to remember, take a step back. The Republicans got the majority in 1994. Before that, they were in the minority for like 40 something years. So they were accustomed to just being in the minority all the time. And so when there was turnover back and forth, you got Republican members who decide, ah, I don't want to go back into the minority, I'm retiring, and somebody else new comes in and runs. The younger members, like myself, who are in the 118th Congress, the 117th, what is shaping up to be like what the 119th is going to look like, they are probably, they're more street conservative let me put it that way. Their politics are more street conservative than what you would consider to be traditional conservative. There's more turnover amongst younger Republicans than there were other older Republicans. 
And so I think what you're going to see is a, is a time period moving forward where that turnover and that youth is going to have much more impact on how we spend the people's money at Washington. And is that good for the conservative movement all, oh, all yeah. together? Oh, absolutely. It's, first of all, look, I've been in Congress eight months. I was in the state legislature for four years. I will tell you, like, I live in a bubble. I do. I fully acknowledge the bubble. I know what it is. I can recognize it. I can see it. You know what I mean? Like, there's people over there. I've known them for a long time. I love y'all. You know, but when you're elected, you see each other. You go, to, you go to cocktail receptions together. You have dinner together. You might be on some trip. Your kids are there. You get to know their kids. You don't really spend a lot of time unless you make it a focus to be in your district and actually talking to the people when you were just a person because you're being shuttled from meeting to meeting to meeting to event, stuff like this. I'm leaving, I'm getting on a plane, I'm going to DC, I gotta take care of stuff in DC, I'm flying home, I got events Friday and meetings. Like this is what happens, you're in a bubble, it's different. The longer you leave anybody in a situation like that, the more detached from reality they become which is why we need term limits 100%. Well, you, 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 yeah, oh, you I answered the question. I jumped, That's okay. Just That's then okay. get out. I'll take the mic. I what got would it. be? What, just go. I'll do this. I'm never needed. I know that. Um, what would be your, because the first answer, first question would be, would, would term limits help? Second question, because yeah. you answered that yes, would be, what would be your model for term limits? Uh, term limits would definitely help. It, it just goes without question that you need people who've not been tied to the apparatus. It's different, man. I, it, it's, you guys, lo I love everybody's got their passion. You're here, you're listening. I will tell you, it is different once you kind of cross the velvet rope and you become elected. The longer you're in there, the harder it is to remain the, with the same level of passion and focus you had before you got there. It's just hard. Everybody's pulling on you. So I think eight years is enough. Mm -hmm. I think, honestly... In the House, eight years. In the Senate, because they have six-year terms, two terms of 12. You go, you do your business, you leave. You know, whatever that kind of looks like, we'll see what happens in the end. Um, do I, here's a better question. Do I think term limits are actually possible? That was the third question, so, yeah. See, I told you, you could have went and stood over there. I got this, folks. We're going to roll with me. I got, you know, I can handle this. It's anyway. thing I've known you for so long. I know, right? It's, I'm very engaging. Have you noticed this? Wonderfully so. I don't know. This is probably the best you know, session you guys have had all day, right? You know, it's, it's very engaging. Anyway, to my colleagues in the Our Florida House over there. Our term limits possible. Our term limits possible, yes. More so now than at any other point, because what is to come, and it's not just about members of Congress, and it's not about what you guys think. I love y'all, but I'm being honest with you. It is about having a president of the United States who will come in, who's going to come, that is going to look at it and say, I'm going to make this a part of my platform. This is what I'm going to require of Congress. And if you, if you can match the popularity, a president with the right level of popularity, with the bully pulpit, with the desire of people, which has been consistent now at about 75 to 80% of the voters want congressional term limits, you can create the right mix depending on the right pressure point. This always requires pressure. There's a, there are key pressure points when it is possible. I think because of the way we're handling the people's money, those pressure points are gonna be becoming more and more frequent, and I do think it is possible. And this is a good segue to actually talking about the debt, because I, I read a statistic that uh, in 2008, when Barack Obama took office, the national debt was roughly $8 trillion. Yep. We're now approaching $30 trillion yep. in a period of roughly you know, uh, 12, 13 years. Yeah. How do you even begin to tackle that? Um, do you guys want the real answer, or you want the political one? Okay. How, how about both? I want, I want to hear both. Okay. The political one is, well, you know, we're just going to have to find ways to live within our means and cut out the ways. And we'll, we'll get to a good spot where we can really start balancing our budget in about eight to ten years, which is really never. And then we're good. And you sell that. It doesn't make people think about what they're engaged with in the federal government, but it sounds good like you're taking it seriously. That's the political answer. 
The real answer is, is that you first have to reform Social Security. You then have to reform Medicare. You then have to go through the federal, and, and let me stop there. Those two programs are roughly 65 to 70 percent of federal spending. You can do anything you, you, you want in discretionary spending, that, and oh, it's automatic. That stuff happens whether the government shuts down. So back up. The next time we come to a government shutdown, do not let the media lie to you that grandma is not going to be able to get her check. Social Security and Medicare are automatic programs. They happen regardless if the federal government is open or not. They just go, okay? You have to tackle those two first, and you have to bend the long-term cost curve of the federal government. And I'm talking 30 years out. My career is finance, by the way, so I know a thing or two about this. You got to bend the long-term cost curve. That's the way you get the federal debt under control. Now, how do you get the budget under control? Is when you tackle those two programs, those two reforms, and you, meet, you actually marry them to going through the federal agencies and actually pulling out the duplicative programs. We have programs that we currently spend money on that there is no legal authorization to spend the money. It doesn't exist anymore, but we just spend the money. Um, a friend of mine's dad, he's in the room, and his dad told me when I first went into the Florida house, because you know, he was my predecessor, he said, Passing bills, you can try to get that done, but you could do a whole lot more if you can get it in the budget. Because if you get it in the budget, it just takes on a life of its own, and it just goes. And that's what happens at the federal level. So you got to go in there and clean out a bunch of duplicative programs that are not legally authorized anymore. And then the last part of that is you have to get to the right tax mix. I'm not talking about raising taxes. I'm not. You got to get to the right tax mix that allows your economy to grow and flourish, but optimizes collections using that tax code into the treasury. For people who do not know this, the current tax policy, the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, the Trump tax cuts that they say added a trillion to the debt, that's just on the CBO score. Right now, under Tax Cut and Jobs Act, the federal government has raised more money than at any other point in American history. And it's raised more money as a percentage of our economy into the federal treasury than under any other tax system in the history of the country. The Bush tax cuts when Obama was president, obviously Trump, George W. Bush, Ronald Reagan, nothing has raised more tax revenue as a percentage of our economy than the Trump tax cuts. So when I say this to moderate and liberal news commenters, they just kind of look frozen. They're like, what? I'm like, yes, as a percentage of your economy, that's a good thing. I think if you can accomplish those four, that takes us a good way to getting there. And I think I've got time for one more. Um, you better make it good. What's that? This better be good. Not as good as yours. Okay. All right. It's, it's much easier, I would imagine, to be in the minority than in the majority. Just from a political perspective, it's easier to oppose things than to actually have to govern. All right. We're looking pretty good for Republicans in the 2022 cycle for Congress. What would be two or three of your priorities should Republicans take control of the House and or Senate and you have a, a vehicle to leadership on how to use that majority wisely? Well, was, that, was that a good question? A great question. First thing I will tell you, every Republican doesn't want to be in the minority but they love being in a minority. Because all you get to do is just say, no, it's them, they did it. And they're crazy and vote for me and vote for us. That's easy, that's easy stuff. The hard stuff comes when you actually have to be the ones responsible. Um, a, alongside, the, along the lines of the things, I believe we should lead on social security reform. And I know nobody really talks about that. Nobody's talked about it since George W. Bush tried private accounts in 2005, 05, 06. Because, to be blunt, and he's a nice man, but George W. Bush didn't drive it through the door no matter what. Because if he had done that, the program would be far, far more solvent in the out years, the cost would be far less to the American people, and Grandma still would have got her check in the process. We'd be in a much better space as a country if he had pushed it through. So I think we should lead on that. We shouldn't be afraid from it. And here's why, because obviously credibility is a big deal right mm -hmm. now in politics, right? 
I mean, the, credit, the president has no credibility. He doesn't know what he's doing. If you can reform the longest running entitlement in the history of our country and grandma can still get her check and the taxpayer is better off financially, you have more credibility to do the other reforms through the federal apparatus than you have with anything else. Because now you can be like, well, look, we just did it with Social Security. Let us do it with immigration. Look, we just did it with them both. Let's do it with financial regulation. Um, the second big one, and we've seen it just during COVID, people were struggling, especially small, super small businesses, because they didn't have a banking relationship. If you have a checking account with Wells Fargo or Bank of America, that is not a banking relationship. I'm a former banker, I know. A banking relationship is if you know your lender, you know the credit guys, they can help you move through the red tape, figure out how the stuff works, get your application in, get written up, get out. That's a banking relationship. Congress has destroyed community banking in the United States. They did that with Dodd-Frank coming out of the last financial issue in 2009. So Social Security one, Dodd-Frank reform number two, it would unleash capital to micro businesses and small businesses in our country, which is what we really need to have happen right now. And it gives us the credibility for reforming the rest of the federal, the federal apparatus. I have said this often that there need to be 434 more of you uh, sitting in the halls of Congress. <laughs> well, that's just impossible. <laughs> you There's know what I mean? There is only one Byron Donalds. My mama, you know, that's impossible. Join me in thanking Congressman Byron Donalds. Thank you, guys. And I'm going to turn it right back over to Preston. Well, Y'all had fun, didn't you? That was better. Okay, there we go. Scott. During my time as governor, we worked hard to make our great state and the city of Miami one of the best places in the nation for businesses and families to succeed. We did that by cutting taxes and burdensome regulations and paying down our debt, all while generating job creation and business growth that helped fund record investments in education, transportation, the environment, and more. Now, as your U.S. Senator, I'm working to bring Florida's economic playbook to the federal level. Our nation is nearly $30 trillion in debt. Thanks to Washington's reckless, out of control spending, and it's headed to $45 trillion in debt if Democrats get their way. This spending has serious consequences that hurt families in Florida and all across our great nation. It's causing rising inflation and higher prices for hardworking families and leaving our nation with unsustainable debt that will ultimately fall on taxpayers. I won't let Washington spend into oblivion at the expense of the American people. I'll keep fighting this reckless spending and pushing for smart policy that fuels the American economy and creates good paying jobs, just like we did in Florida. It's up to all of us to demand accountability for the tax dollars we send to Washington. I hope you all will enjoy this great event and the incredible city of Miami. Thank you. I'm here. We'll fill the rest of the panel. And we've got a couple stories to tell you because we're calling audibles. It's football season. So we got a few goal line audibles. Pepe Diaz, Jose Felix Diaz, David Barrero, State Representative, and Bobby Goodlatte, who's part of, as I'll describe it, part of the, the kind of mass exodus from San Francisco to Miami during COVID, um, are all joining me here for a conversation that's going to be part Miami part Miami and crypto and politics and business and where these things collide. A um, couple disclaimers on the front end. The mayor of Miami is on his way and Pepe Diaz can speak to that, but he, we're going to have those of you who are signed up for the reception, you'll be here when he arrives. And we're still going to get him to be a part of the, uh, the overall broadcast 
And so we'll get it to you. If you're not here when he's here, uh, the thoughts that he shares, we'll make sure they're emailed to you in a timely manner. And Bobby, before we get started, I'll let you speak on behalf of Pomp, who you and I have both been communicating with via text message. Yeah, so is this on? No, it's not. not on. This one's on. Okay. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so I'm going to try my best to channel my inner pomp, which is not exactly my, my strong suit, but um, my friend Anthony uh, sends his, uh, his, his uh, well wishes from Los Angeles. He couldn't be here today, and uh, yeah, Weston and I have been chatting with him, and uh, yeah, he, he's, very, he's very apologetic that he can't be here and so I'm going to try issued, to fill in for he him. He <laughs> issued an IOU that all of you will uh, benefit from. And so we're going to iron out exactly how the IOU um, is exchanged, and it may very well be transacted in Bitcoin. Uh, yeah, so he's told truth. me he owes me quite a bit, and uh, I think, I think well, he owes we, Weston even more. We, we so, will, in all seriousness, yeah. the content that uh, Pomp would have brought here and will bring to this group, we know how to get a hold of all of you. We will capture that content and we will get it for you. It's just not going to be on the rainy afternoon of uh, September 8th. So I think there's a good conversation to be had here. And like I said, when we wrap up here, and this is true for those of them, we've got kind of the, the, the socials over here to the side. Those of you who are watching online don't know that there's kind of the social corner that's developed and then those who are more committed to the content that are in the room. Um, but for those who are signed up to hang around for the, uh, the reception to follow, we're going to bring everybody back in here if we can with the mayor. Let's get started though, Bobby. I want, I want you to uh, give us some perspective what people may or may not know about you. Even if you Google search Bobby Goodlatte, you'd see, you know, early Facebook designer. Uh, you became an angel investor. You happened upon a company called Coinbase, uh, gave them money in what I assume was kind of a life-changing transaction for you. And, but before all of that, you and I kind of were raised in the unseemly world of politics. My dad, who's a former congressman, is right here. Your dad and my dad did uh, con Congress things together for a long time. So you, your first language, I assume, is kind of politics, like mine is. And I'm just curious, off the top, this session was going to be uh, about crypto and its collision with fiscal policy and monetary policy and what the future of money may very well look like. I think you probably have a unique perspective here. Yeah, I mean, I think um, in many ways, I almost feel like my childhood and, and maybe, you know, some of the values my father taught me informed some of my uh, thinking around around crypto for sure. And, and maybe maybe you could say the same for yourself. But, you know, to be the child of a politician is a very unusual childhood. It's very it's very lucky, very privileged childhood, but it's a very strange one. And um, yeah, absolutely. You know, I think I think my background is that, you know, had a similar uh, childhood as you, and then um, you know studied um, computer science in, in, in college. Was was sort of a bad CS student. I was more focused on uh, design then, and um, uh, my, my interest in design uh, wound up attracting the attention of Facebook uh, back in 2007. And so I joined. I joined Facebook at a fairly early uh, era, and then um, as soon as I left Facebook, I started angel investing. And then, kind of the first, um, you know, uh, angel investment check I wrote was into Coinbase. So that was kind of, you know, not not a bad start. Yeah, and and uh, I can't say the, the the subsequent checks have been quite as, um, you know, fortuitous. But um, but yeah, and um, um, but but I, I really I really do think that some of the values that um, Maybe I, maybe I learned growing up, um, maybe kind of pre-wired me towards uh, an interest in crypto. Pepe, why don't you speak? You're a former state legislator. You've seen the political side, operate in the business world now. You know, as I gather, you're a man about town. You're an Orange Bowl board member. And, and speak, though, you're an advisor and, and friend of the mayor. At a time of just ridiculous division in politics, one mayor, to anybody paying attention, has risen above it to the point that I, I, I joke with people, I, I see what left-wing people sing the praises of Mayor Suarez often on Twitter, and I don't think they realize he's not one of them, so to speak. He's transcended all that. That's why we're in the Miami moment we're in. It's probably part of the reason Bobby uh, moved from the West Coast here in the middle of COVID. Talk about you know, having a front row seat to watching it all transpire. There's no doubt that Miami is 
the sexiest city on earth right now, and that our mayor is a true celebrity. I mean, I've traveled the world, and in Switzerland or New York or in Chile, they ask about Francis Suarez. He is an anomaly in every way, and he has transcended politics. He's a guy uh, who doesn't wear his politics on his sleeves. He puts the city first, and I've always believed that every major city gets defined in its second century. Miami is a super young city, and before the 1920s, there was no air conditioning here, so nobody was here except for mosquitoes. So now is when we're really starting to see the city get its feet under it, and we have some amazing leaders, like you saw before, you know, from David to uh, Vance and Lupus, who was here, uh, to Juan Fernandez Barking and Danny Perez, you have a youth movement, and Francis embodies that, that this city is not for those that were born into royalty. You know, I, I didn't come from a political family. I came from a very humble family. My parents did not know anything about politics, yet I was able to run for office and win. And I think people from the outside, whether you're from California or New York, you see that Miami is a place where anybody can make it. And there's countless stories of people that have triumphed here, made a lot of money, accumulated power quickly, and made a real difference in this community. Um, I think that Francis Suarez uh, caught lightning in a bottle. We all know that you know he uh, uses Twitter and social media in a very unconventional way. Uh, he is not a millennial, but he speaks like one. And he creates that bridge uh, between his dad's generation, who was very political and came to this city and really established themselves, and his generation. So the weirdest thing about Francis is he's the first mayor in the history of Miami to actually be born in Miami. And that's a testament to the city that people have come from Puerto Rico and Cuba and other parts of the country and succeeded here. And I think that that is the story that needs to be told. Miami is the city of the future, uh, but more importantly, Miami is the city of now. David, we talk a lot about the future of conservatism. I mean, I think one of the things that, that drew us into a conversation about what the future of conservatism is, is what the last four years of it looked like, last five, six years of it looked like. Um, I tell people pretty openly now, after making a lot of friends down here in this community, this is the future of conservatism. And you're one of those guys, there are seven, this kind of blows my mind as a Tennessean, there are seven conservatives in the Miami-Dade state legislative delegation who are in their 30s. And you're 32, I think you're the second youngest of the group. Uh, talk about what it's like to be in the middle of that moment. If you got some thoughts on crypto and its convergence with fiscal sure. policy. Yeah, thank you away. so much, Weston. Well, first I'll say that I think it's so important to demonstrate to the world, obviously the rest of our country, but to the world, is that this country is stable that our government is stable. Because other countries are moving billions of dollars, like from what we saw in Venezuela, right now there's billions of dollars that are moving out of Brazil, and they're putting them, parking them in United States bank accounts because of the stability of our government. It is so important to have a stable government, and because they look to places to park their money that are stable. If you have places that are turning more socialistic, if you have places that are turning more communistic with their policies, which happens over time, investors look at that and they see that the value of their currency, if you look today, like the, the Brazilian uh, dollar, how it compared about a year ago, how the value of it has diminished so much, even within the past year, you'll see that just frivolous spending and how it affects the power of investors uh, 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 in foreign countries. And so to that effect, the reason why, from an economic standpoint, we need to have conservative policies the way to go is because you attract so much money to this country. And that's why, you know, I've championed education that educates the next generation about why government spending, frivolous government spending, um, socialistic government policies where the government needs to provide for everything is wasteful. It is very dangerous. 
I mean, we see what happened with communist-style policies where government has come in and taken over entire industries. It has led to massive famine in countries throughout history, and it happens over time. And so when people say, no, you're a fearmongerer by trying to educate against communism and socialism, uh, let me tell you, it, it, it doesn't happen overnight. It's like slow cooking a frog. And so the notion that the federal government can bail out hundreds of trillions of dollars in student debt over time um, is just, a, it's, it's a completely dangerous philosophy to think that we can have government bail us out. So that's why I'm, I'm for advocating for, for conservative policy. Bobby, this is, this is getting into stuff that politicians rarely venture into, and that's why I'm going to give you this question. It was a question I was going to ask Pomp. The dollar is at the heart of the explanation as to why America believes it can or is privileged enough to borrow anywhere between 25 and 30 cents on a dollar in any given year. Now, it's been dollar for dollar or more in the pandemic, but we have we, we've basically begun to just accept as our norm trillion dollar deficits. And you'll hear explanations from sophisticated economists who say, well, the dollar is a reserve currency, and so we can play by a different set of rules than the Germans or the Koreans or the Swiss. All countries that uh, pride themselves on fiscal responsibility, or at least living within their means in good times, so that uh, you borrow only when uh, you, you know, a bad economy might justify it. Explain the convergence that you got some crypto fans and, and Bitcoin believers in the room, and then you got some people like me who are relative lay people. Talk about the convergence in the years to come of the dollar and crypto, and what, and this is theoretical, but what it might mean for a country that plans on, this is the CBO estimate, not mine, that plans on borrowing another $120 trillion in the next 30 years. So I will do my best to channel my inner pomp and fill shoes that are not mine to fill, but um, I, I would say this. I think um, Bitcoin's greatest role, in my opinion, and actually, maybe I doubt Pomp would agree with me on this, but, but you know, he's not here, so here we are. Um, I would say I think Bitcoin's greatest role is to force responsibility upon central bankers. In other words, the existence of a stateless uh, decentralized currency unto itself does not mean that the United States dollar does not have to be the world's reserve currency. But what it does say is that the United States dollar needs to um, be responsible. And I think Bitcoin, in its greatest sense, uh, demands responsibility from central bank currencies. Um, the other thing that I'm sure that Pomp would point out if he was here is that um, uh, governments around the world may start uh, using Bitcoin and other digital currencies as their uh, central reserve uh, currency. So uh, just yesterday, uh, El Salvador, you know, it's a, it's a small country, but it is a country, uh, they, they established Bitcoin as, a, as their national currency. And um, I, I think that might be um, somewhat of a harbinger of things to come, right? And, and again, again, it's something to say where it's like, you know, I think it's very important that there are constraints upon um, our, our fiscal policy. And uh, if, if we're irresponsible with how we, um, how, how we, um, how, how we, you know, basically um, administer the world's reserve currency, then there needs to be hard caps on either side. And, and I think cryptocurrency is actually one uh, very, very helpful, very useful uh, guardrail against, um, um, you know, falling into some sort of uh, hyperinflationary scenario. I assume to you guys, Pepe and David, that if you're in Miami <clears throat> in this crypto moment, it makes everybody a crypto expert, kind of like we're all amateur epidemiologists now. Like I know more about viruses than anybody. I have no medical <laughs> degree. But I, I can imagine, you know, that in order to speak fluently in this town right now, you got to have some thoughts. And I, one of the things that occurs to me that is maybe a part of what's going on in Miami that is dr drastically underestimated, even in the tech world, but certainly beyond it, is that if there's anything to the notion that uh, many like Pomp would uh, posit that cryptocurrency is sort of like the internet for money, and we could be at this transformative moment in history. Where, what does that mean Miami is? 
And what's the potential of Miami uh, in this kind of Suarez capital of capital era that we're in? Um, well, I completely agree that if you're in Miami and you're in the mix, you're going to know a little bit about crypto because everybody has a friend who made a lot of money on crypto. Um, I actually got involved this year with a Bitcoin conference when they were coming to Miami. Um, everything was in flux. They needed to make a decision about what city they were going to go to. They thought Miami might be a great place, but there wasn't a single conference held anywhere else in Miami uh, before this one. So they had to make a, a pretty quick decision. And it was an easy one because of Mayor Suarez and some of the things he's been doing at the city, like accepting Bitcoin and allowing the city to to accept you know fees and other things in Bitcoin. But what we do know is that Miami has quickly not only become the capital of capital, but it's become the capital of Bitcoin. Some major Bitcoin institutions have moved their headquarters here. I'll tell you from that conference alone, there was one day which was called Whale Day. And every single person there, there paid at least $20,000 to be there. And there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people from all over the world that had converged in Miami to be there for Whale Day and tell their stories about why they thought this was the most open place for business. And as somebody who's traveled across America during COVID, there is nothing like Miami. Good luck finding the buzz that we have here in LA or New York or other places that historically have been epicenters of culture and, 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 and entertainment in this country. So if you're a Bitcoin person and you've made all this money, would you rather be in a dead place like California paying higher taxes or would you rather come to this very entrepreneurial young city full of promise and hope and diversity and that's what's attracted all this capital here. And I think that we are in a convergence. I, I think that uh, none of us, not even the smartest uh, cryptocurrency expert can figure out where this is heading, but we're definitely on the verge of something. And I think Miami has uh, figured out that this is worth looking into and worth being part of. And obviously our mayor is a big part of that. But, you know, it takes more than a mayor. Our city commission approved that. Our governor uh, has been very friendly. As a matter of fact, I think Florida was the first state to pass a cryptocurrency law back in 2015. So we are ahead of the curve. Uh, I think the sky's the limit for this opportunity. Um, I'm paying attention. I'm investing. And, uh, you know, I think that there'll be a big payoff for those that came in early. Yeah. I, I would just add that... Uh, what we were kind of reiterating earlier about messaging. Um, I think we have been successful and I personally experienced it literally just this past weekend. I was speaking to a hedge fund management uh, person who was telling me how the buzz is in New York City that large hedge fund management companies are moving to Miami, that they're opening up satellite offices in Miami. And he was asking me, how can we get on a phone call with Mayor Francis Suarez about having incentives to come in place to move companies who are already looking and already opening up offices over here in Miami? So I think we've done a good job at branding us as a very favorable to um, financial management companies, hedge fund management companies, and of course, uh, Bitcoin companies. So um, I, I, I think if we continue to champion that message and reach out to Bitcoin companies, reach out to financial management companies and say, we have incentives, we're attracting, we have the talent, we have forward thinking uh, young millennials who want to work in these careers, then we're going to see greater movement of that over here. Let me, let me chime in a little more. Like three years ago, my brother-in-law, who's brilliant, uh, started his own company and it was a tech company. Uh, he was the first person ever to go through the Y Combinator from Miami, which if you don't know the Y Combinator, it's kind of like the Harvard for tech companies. And back then, three years ago, not too long ago, it was a stigma to come from Miami. Uh, it was seen as a place where there were no developers. It was seen as a place where, uh, you know, tech companies ran away from. And now they're all coming here and they're coming here in droves. And like David said, and like the mayor says, this is more than just Bitcoin. It's more than just cryptocurrency. It's Citadel. It's, you know, it's all the biggest companies, Blackstone, it's Goldman Sachs. They've realized in this age of COVID that you no longer have to be in New York to matter. 
you could be wherever you want in the world. And if you could be wherever you want in the world, why wouldn't you want to be in Miami? Bobby, give us a deep dive here. We'll wrap up in the next couple minutes. But your thoughts, uh, for those of us who might need to be educated on the subject, on the role that stable coins could play in, you know, in, in an environment, I think all too often, politics looks backwards. If you've ever been in the investment world, you've had great success. I spent several years in the venture capital world. It's all about seeing into the future. Politicians are more likely to be debating uh, whether we should have gone to Afghanistan 20 years ago instead of how we ought to be thinking about China 20 years from now. Is our willingness and openness to stable coins um, potentially a competitive advantage or disadvantage in a world where China is guns blazing? I think it's a great question. And um, I've, I've personally been, so just to disclose my own biases, you know, I've been an investor in many of these uh, stablecoin projects, uh, you know, both in terms of being an investor in Coinbase, which is a supporter of USDC, which is a, a treasury-backed stablecoin, but I've also been an investor in uh, uh, more uh, algorithmically-based stablecoins uh, like MakerDAO and a, a few other uh, uh, new ones. And all I have to say is this. I think um, um, if, if stablecoins are uh, a, a means of enshrining the U.S. dollar as sort of the benchmark of, okay, this is how we price assets in this digital world, then what are we doing in terms of uh, having regulators trying to crack down on stable coins? In other words, um, if, 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 uh, if USDC or DAI or an, any number of other uh, US dollar peg stable coins have become the benchmark for uh, how, how we, how we uh, uh, trade and assess uh, different assets within crypto. Um, are, are we just shooting ourselves in the foot by trying to um, regulate these things? Because as far as I've seen, um, there have been very little incidents of, 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 of any sort of calamities that, that would cause um, the SEC or any of these other uh, regulators to, to, to try to crack down on these things. And, um, and, and again, I think, I think it's a, it would be a very good thing if, if um, if the U.S. dollar became the digital currency of the world, and and one one way of that happening is through these stable coins. Again, that's just my opinion. Like, like I don't I don't I don't speak on behalf of uh, Coinbase or any other um, investment I've made. Just that's just kind of my personal opinion. But um, I, I think it's a very good thing if uh, the U.S. dollar became the digital reserve currency, and stable coins are a great way of doing that. David, I would just like to say that. Um, we, so there's this n notion that we shouldn't invest into cryptocurrencies because of the volatility. And true, I mean, granted, many of the cryptocurrencies that are out there are very volatile and they're based purely on speculation. Um, and I was mentioning earlier about the importance of having stability, stability in your government, and I also think stability in your dollar for investments to grow. Um, but the, what really convinced me uh, about the competitive advantage that we have with cryptocurrencies is that allowing for the growth of cryptocurrencies and encouraging even investment into uh, stable cryptocurrencies is that it actually strengthens the U.S. dollar. Because if you have investors that are putting their money into cryptocurrencies, maybe people who are more prone to, or favorable to risk or open to, to taking risk, then it creates a stronger market for the US dollar and it makes it more stable so that you have people who are a little bit more risk averse investing into the US dollar. So I would argue that investing into cryptocurrencies can actually strengthen the power and the stability of the US dollar. Yeah, that's, that's exactly. if we don't allow the innovation to happen here, it will happen elsewhere and, and, and we'll just be you know, powerless to, to, to control it. Yeah, and denominated ultimately in their currency, possibly, right? Exactly. Hey, thank you guys. All of you pinch hitting, except Bobby. I appreciate you. To those of you who joined us online, thanks. Uh, we've been on Miami time. We will follow up with you all by email with our conversation that's upcoming later this evening uh, with Mayor Francis Suarez. And to the, those of you who've been with us in person, if you've signed up to join us for the reception, we'll see you over there. Thanks again. <laughs>